All right, so now we get to what I think is probably one of the most fun parts of the workshop. I was real happy to get this working, which is attacking machines by messing with the DIL libraries. And we're going to do DIL hijacking, PMA 124. This is the simple case where you use a companion Trojan to load a fake library. So you need the Metasploit framework, which I just installed. We were talking about that before recording the video. And Metasploit will make a malicious DIL for you. So once you've got it installed, you can make a DIL file that will do any malicious thing you want. So I'm just going to make a 64-bit shell bind TCP, which will just start listening on port 4444. And anybody that connects there will be able to control the machine, which is, you know, a pretty sloppy exploit. But it's just one to show that I've got it working. Now, um, let's see. If I can paste that into a command prompt, I found that um, because of my virtual machines, copy and paste often fails. Oh, it worked this time. OK, so I'm working right here in C. Uh, I'm in the wrong directory, though. I want to be in my downloads folder. So I'm in the system directory. So let me go there, which is users. The name of the user is IE user. And downloads is here. All right, now I should be able to run that command. And what this will do is create something called shellbind.dil in this directory. And that will just do something malicious. Now, libraries, when you first load the library, it runs a program called dil main, an entry point called dil main, which um, prepares the library for use. And when you make Metasploit malware, it just puts all the malware right in dil main, and that's all. So the library no longer contains any actual usable functions. So it's a really pretty miserable imitation of a Windows library. Only really dumb programs will fall for this, and we're going to find one of them. So let's turn off the firewall so we can use it once we get it going. Um, firewall. Uh, ought to be able Maybe this? Yeah, you just didn't want the advanced one. This is the one I wanted, the one that makes it easy to turn it off. And it is already off. Oh, good. All right. All right. And now we can talk about this service. We are going to exploit this service. And this technique we're going to use here is extremely powerful to use Process Monitor to find a vulnerability. So let's open Services. Here's Services. Um, before when we used Process Explorer, you could see all these pink processes running, which are the Windows system services, and there are tons of Windows services. A lot of them are not used. A lot of them are not always launched. And so they're pretty um, ripe for exploiting. For example, this one here, Distributed Transaction Coordinator. This one right here. If you read this thing, it coordinates transactions that use multiple resource managers, such as databases. And so this thing is probably not really used on my Windows 10 machine at all. It's just sitting there anyway. So what I'm going to do is go to its properties and see what privileges it runs at. And if I go to log on, it logs on with network service account, which is probably fine. And it might be good enough to become the network service operator for what I want to do. But to make it easy to see the result, I'm just going to elevate it to system account and apply. So this runs as system. It will not take effect until you stop and restart the service. OK, so I'm going to make it um, system. And I'll stop it anyway. All right. So next time it starts, it's going to run as system. So I'll be able to see if I've succeeded in elevating my privileges to system by taking over that service. And the most important thing about this is you want to learn how to use Process Monitor, which is fantastic. There was a security expert on Twitter talking about how he's found tons of bugs just with this tool, Procmon. It is really amazing because it shows you all the steps that the operating system goes through to load a file. And by the way, all this is doing is giving you a better way to look at Windows system logs. It's just showing the events. So 166,000 events have gone by just in a few seconds. So I'm going to stop it monitoring, which I think is this one. There, I've stopped it. These icons in the latest version have been shrunk pretty much, but the third icon will stop it. 
Then there's a clear. I think it's this one. Yep, that clears all the old events. Okay, now in order to avoid seeing 100,000 events there, which is doing me no good at all. Oh, let me see if I can make the font bigger. I think I might be able to. Options. Font. Okay. Let's choose a bigger font. Likely see the console bold 12. Let's see how that looks. Yep, that'll be better. Make my columns a little wider. All right. Now, I have to put in a filter. And so my filter, filter, I want to see what that um, MSDTC does. So I'm going to make the process name contains MSDTC, the distributed transaction coordinator. So I'm only going to see events from the um, transaction coordinator and go back into the filter. And I also want to look for things that refer to a path ending in DIL because I want to see how it loads the libraries. Ends with .dll. There. Those are my two conditions. And it's real important, of course, to get these conditions right. That's the whole power of this tool. This tool helps you narrow your focus down to just interesting stuff instead of just seeing uh, all the junk. So I'll turn that on. Now, when I restart that process <coughs> in services, which I guess I closed, I should see what it does to find the libraries it needs to start that process. So it is distributed transaction coordinator, and I start it. And somehow I did not, oh, I forgot to start sniffing. Whoops, I have to stop it. And remember, I turned off the uh, sniffing here, which I think is this one. Start capturing. Yep, now it's capturing stuff. Now I start this, and there we go. Now I caught a bunch of data, so I'm going to stop capturing, and I'm going to look at what happened here. Okay, it tried to load an image, and this is just a process ID number, which is always going to be the same. So it loaded an image, and here's the various libraries it loaded. Kernel32.dil and so on. And let's see, I want to see the result. So I'm going to shrink some of these boring windows, panes here, like this one, and this one, and expand my results. OK. All right. Now, I want to find the um, this one with name not found, oci.dil. That's what I'm hoping to find. Um, there it is, name not found. See, notice this means that this thing loaded a library, a Microsoft system library called oci.dil, and it did not find it. And yet, the process started and it ran anyway. It did not stop with an error message. So what that means is this is a important error from the developer. This means the developer included that library, but then they never actually called any functions in that library, which is a pretty easy to mistake to make, of course, if you think about writing code and especially going through many versions. So that's what I'm hoping to use that nasty Microsoft uh, Metasploit library. Because if it was to try to use the functions in the library, it would not be fooled by that Metasploit dill that doesn't have any exported functions at all. But in this case, it apparently never uses that library. So if I just put that Metasploit dill where it expects to find this library, it will just load it. And when it loads, it'll run the dill main, and that'll execute the code. So all I have to do, and by the way, you can also see it in Process Explorer. Let's take a look at that. I see it in my instructions, and that's not a good thing to look at. If you run Process Explorer, we did this before, you can see the libraries in running code this way. So if I go and find that thing, which is um, MSDTC, should be up here some places in the services. Um, there it is, MSDTC. So here's all the dills, and they're in alphabetical order. 
and you can see that OCI.dil is gone. It goes from N to O to R. So it didn't actually load the dil at all. It looked for it. It wasn't there. And it's running anyway. So apparently it doesn't really need that dil. And it doesn't really use it or notice what's in there. So that's what we want. All we have to do is stop the process and put our shell bind in the location where it expects that dil. So let me, we're done with this. And uh, I don't think we need services anymore. We can do it from the command line. What we need is an administrator command prompt window because we need to be able to write into the C Windows System 32 folder. So in fact, I think I'm just going to work from here. So I'll do net stop msdtc. Uh, yep. OK, that stops it. Now I'm just going to check into a directory of users, i.e. user, downloads, and star.dil. Make sure the malicious dil is there. And there it is, shellbind.dil. So what I need to do is copy uh, Actually, star.dil will do, but I want to put it here in the current directory as oci.dil. OK, so now that means when I restart the service, it should run my malware. So let's do net start msdtc. And OK, it started. And now if I was to do a netstat minus an pipe more, I will find, uh, well, I expected to see a listening process on 4444, and it seems like I'm not. That's rude. So I'm afraid it may have failed on me here. It should have worked, though. Um, I might just be coming later. Oh, yeah. Nope. Hmm. How rude. Well, my glorious demonstration didn't work out as well as I thought. Let's see if I just messed it up. Find string 4444. Nope, it's really not working. Huh, should have worked. So I wonder what I did wrong. Anyway, uh, that's that's the uh, thing that should work. It should be listening, and you should be able to see it there. Um, and uh, using the shell, you should be able to get a connection. I must have made some kind of mistake here, although I'm not seeing it. Um, because I don't see the listening process, but uh, restarting the machine might help and so on. Anyway, that's what I wanted to show you. This is the simple way to hijack a uh, service, and I think I'm just going to talk about the next one rather than trying to demonstrate it because it's a little complicated, but the next one is the one that really took me like a week to work out. I was very happy to get this going. Um, the Procmon would probably tell me how I messed up. Well, I suppose it might. if. Um, anyway, um, it'd be fun to debug, but let me just talk about what about the case where you have a library that's actually in use. And in here, um, you need Metasploit and you need um, uh, Windows Studio, Visual Studio. But the point is, I found a program here called B BG Info, which is a system utility from Microsoft that prints information on the screen about your RAM and stuff. And the BG Info, when you run um, SysInternals Process Monitor on that one, you will see that it tries to load version.dil from the current directory where the program is running from. And it doesn't look for it in C Windows System 32 until later. So that means I have an opportunity to put a malicious dil in the directory where the download is, which is a pretty easy place for me to put things. I do not need administrator rights to do that. And it will then load when this program starts. And if you try dill replacement from a Metasploit dill, it won't work because it notices it. It will crash like this. So you have to build a dill proxy that will proxy all the system, all the uh, API calls through that dill to the real function. And that turns out to be pretty easy to do. You use an export viewer and you get a list of all the functions in that dill, of which there's about 14. And then you just write it in Visual Studio, which turns out to be surprisingly easy to do. Um, there's just about a few lines of code here. And then you make these pragma lines, which link it 
Whenever it gets a call for one of these functions, it will just call another executable. And it's very it's not very hard to do. It's all just copy and paste here. So you can create um, a linker that will proxy these calls to the real DIL and sit in the middle and be accepted. So then you in this one, you can create an exploit that just runs any payload you want. And you can write a batch file that will do anything you want. So it's really pretty fun. And it was not too hard to do. But the only part that really took me a long time is figuring out how to build the DIL. Visual Studio is pretty complicated. And there's a lot of properties sheets and switches you have to adjust. And that changes with every version. That's why I only figured out how to do it for this specific version, Visual Studio 2019. You have to create a project, make a DIL in C++. And then there's a couple of adjustments you have to make in the property sheet as you build it, or it won't work. But I was able to get it to work. You can you can totally um, man in the middle a DIL. And this is the attack called DIL proxying, which is written up in a lot of blogs, but I couldn't find a, a nice set of instructions that works, and it took me a while to cobble together this one. So that's good, clean fun.